on the Joy Behar Show. I've been talking to columnist Pete Hamill. Pete, also, are you there, Pete? Yes, I am. You also have a column in Esquire magazine. I do. Give you a little plug there. Okay, and how often do you write in the Post? Tuesdays and Thursdays. That's it? Now that I'm back. Yes. You're back. But you keep leaving and coming back and leaving. No, leave. I was away. I had had a, 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 it's a long, boring story, but I had been, I had had an operation. Um, a Where? Chest operation. A what? A uh, chest operation. A chest. About six months ago, so I had to go away and recuperate. I see. So, um... Um, breast implants? Back. What was it, Pete? What? <laughs> I said breast implants. What did uh, you... <laughs> no, I had... Um, I've written about it, actually, in, uh, in Esquire and some other places. I had a spot on my lung which turned out to be uh, from tuberculosis. Oh, really? And they couldn't tell from any of the tests. I was one of those 10% of the people who tested negative uh, for tuberculosis on the examination to try to figure out what the hell this spot was. Yeah. And I was a cigarette smoker, so, uh, you know, the, the logical th conclusion was, this is probably cancer. Let's go in and get it out of there. I mm -hmm. said, sure, let's do it. Uh, and it turned out uh, to be tuberculosis, uh, you know, that I was part of this huge explosion of tuberculosis in our cities. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control released stats just a, 10 days ago uh -huh. uh, showing this gigantic increase in tuberculosis cases. Uh, Wow. And, but what I was recuperating was not uh, from was not um, tuberculosis, but the examination, but the uh, operation, which put uh, a fourteen and an inch scar across my back. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, all better? Are you are you all better? Oh yeah, I'm fine. Isn't that something that you would pick up TB? Where did you uh, do you think you got it? Well, nobody knows, or you would have prevented it. You know, yeah. but I uh, I had been. I spent a lot of time in Mexico. I could have picked it up there. Mm -hmm. I was in Eastern Europe last year. I could have gotten it there because there's all kinds of tuberculosis in Czechoslovakia and East. What Berlin. about the subway system? And in I New could York. have got yeah. it. I could have got it on 86th Street and Lexington Avenue yeah. in the subway. I could have. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't know. There are so many uh, derelicts wandering in the streets, infected with every known disease and some unknown ones. I think that yeah, I could have gotten it just from some guy. Yeah. You know, Hawking a lunger, as we used to say. You know, Andy Warhol, uh, before he died, uh, made the statement about the people on the street, the dirtier they get, the crazier they get. Oh, God, I think that's true. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, I think they're dirty because they're crazy, but I, I think that's... Some of them, yeah. Yeah, I don't think... But you... the, dirty, the dirt kind of increases the craziness, and yeah. it becomes completely it's, it's, insoluble. It's sad and tragic for those of us who remember this as a different kind of a city. Yeah, right. Um, let's talk to Eddie from New Jersey. Eddie, you're on the air with Pete Hamill. Yes, good morning. Yeah. Um, a question and a brief comment. The question is, why don't you find a country you like? And my comment is, there are times when the only way you fight a madman perpetrating violence is with violence, unless you want to put your head in the sand and throw flowers at him. Pete, you got a big heart. This isn't an unfriendly call, but I think your head is in the sand or out the lunch. Well, I... To answer the first part of what you were saying, I mean, the comment is obviously your right to say. You can say whatever you want about me. Um, but the fact is that I love this country as much as George Bush does or anybody else does. It's my country. I love it. I don't mistake nationalism for patriotism. I love this country because of Fred Astaire and Willie Mays and a lot of other things that are fabulous. I don't love this country particularly because of B-52s. I don't think that it's our job to go around policing the world of every creepy little degenerate uh, dictator everywhere. And I don't think Saddam Hussein was in any way a direct threat to the United States. I don't think Kuwait is somewhere south of Colorado. I think our energies ought to be directed much more towards solving the problems of our own country and then the ones closest to us, Mexico with 82 million people being the most important example of it. Um, I would not live in any other country, and I have the option to do so. This is my country. I love it. Uh, and those of us who criticize it, criticize it out of a spirit of love, not out of a spirit of hate. This guy was committing horrors over there, and the Middle East is not some small, isolated island. It's, it's very important to the economy of the United States and always has been. But it doesn't have to be. In other words, we can get all the oil we want from Mexico and Cuba and, uh, and Venezuela. We don't need oil out of the Middle East. In the 19th century, Napoleon was the greatest threat to Europe, 
We didn't do anything about Napoleon. Thomas Jefferson, who was an infinitely greater president than George Bush, didn't feel constrained to go and intervene in, in Europe against Napoleon. What he did was when Napoleon was distracted, he bought Louisiana from him. But I don't think it's our role to have to do that. I don't like us having to do that unless our own house is in order first. I don't think people should be going down the block telling people how to live unless they really make their own houses uh, but uh, in a, a better than they are than ours happens to be at the present time. I mean, what do you I can say? see the argument for going. Yeah. Somebody's got to go take care of Saddam Hussein because of otherwise this, that, or the other thing. As it turned out, here's a guy who lost an eight-year war to Iran. He couldn't beat Iran, and he had lost that a year before. And we built him into this super juggernaut through an amazing propaganda machine. He ended up with a war machine. We had troops. He ended up, he was going to use poison gas. He was going to, none of this stuff happened, by the way. Uh, and with, the war was over in 100 hours. When we finally went in there and threw a couple of punches at him, he was gone. So I, but meanwhile, we have spent all that money. We're never going to get that money back. We lost a certain number of lives. We killed a lot of people over there. And we've established this policeman of the world role for us at, in which the you know the nine one one of the world somehow rings in Washington. I don't know whether that's our job. But what about what about people who say that we uh, wanted to defend our friends in Kuwait, that they were what, being attacked? What friends in Kuwait? Well, this is the argument that people give. Well, I, I think it's ridiculous. What friends in Kuwait? These aren't friends of ours. These well, people. The first time those, a shot was fired, they ran to Aspen. And they hired the Americans. They, they let the Americans go do it. Well, that was first the elite. What about the people who were left there? For the first time in our history, our army is for rent. We're running around dunning people for the cost of this war. Uh, right um, now. I've my, never heard of that before. We never did that before. My parting comment is I think we established prestige, dignity, and honor. And I think it was a necessity. So I, I totally disagree. Right. With we totally disagree. But I, I agree with the fact that you have the right to disagree with me. And I hope you have the I, I hope you will honor my right to be able to say, say what, I, what I feel about it, which I certainly one do. of us might be right. I certainly do. <laughs> or maybe Down both. The line. We won't say which one. <laughs> All right, well, Eddie. We'll see. History nice. shall absolve one of us. Nice talking to you. Okay, yeah, we should live so long to see this. Okay. Can you stay with me a little longer, certainly. please? Okay. We'll be right back office you know what i mean and i i I, tell you, I have to say joy that it's really this particular war it is it doesn't make me happy or any of the people i know who share my views to be so far out of sync or out of step with their fellow citizens yeah it's a very uncomfortable you know, position but i think it's a mistake for us for anybody that disagrees with this thing to just shut up and line up mm -hmm. i don't think that was the purpose of this country that's not why my parents came here from Ireland. That's not why millions came from Eastern Europe and Italy and all kinds of other places in order to open their mouths and not worry about getting squashed by the state. Yeah. I think we have to remember what this country was about and that if we disagree, to voice the disagreement and not be afraid of it. And one of the most shocking things of the war was the uh, desire and the intention to squelch dissidents. I thought that that was just unconscionable, and it went on for quite a while. Yeah, well, it's going on now. I mean, you can see the likes of Newt Gingrich, Phil Graham, and these other guys, all of whom ducked Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, Dick Cheney, who ducked Vietnam, although I must say Cheney has handled himself with grace. Um, uh, trying to make anybody that voted the other way on this uh, war uh, somehow not patriotic. Yes. I mean, not, pa not patriotic because they voted... Uh, the other way on a war, and the, in which this war, in their mind, is moral because it was successful. Yeah. I don't think things are moral because they're successful. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're necessarily right because they're successful. Do you think that the American people, the the the, uh, the voters, are going to buy this the jingoism, as they call it? Well, uh, jingoism tends to have uh, a short life. I mean, it it, it tends to be of great flare up and then burns out fairly quickly because then we still have to worry about getting across 47th Street. <laughs> you know? Right. And if you right. if it's 2 o'clock in the morning you, you can, and three guys are coming at you with clubs and you wave a little American flag, they don't say, oh, gee, sorry, we'll wait for the next guy. We'll wait for some, mm -hmm. you know, visiting Arab or something. First things first. You know, they, they, they tend to 
say, how can we live in our own country while we're solving the cop problems of the world? But it is amazing how this whole thing has wiped clean the slate for George Bush. The SNL crisis is no longer on the tips of our tongues. The yeah. Iran-Contra right. scandal, all of that stuff is... People just forgot about it. It's boring. Who cares? Right. But we still have to pay for all those. Things. Yeah. We're still paying for the SNLs. We're still going to have to pay a tax increase in order to pay off what all these banks looted out of this country. And, by the way, the war on drugs is not over. It's not won. <laughs> you know, although I think what this, this new world odor, as I call it, is going to lead to... <laughs> um, you know, are going to be gunboats off the coast of Colombia saying, if you don't go in and get Medellin, we'll go in and get them. You know, we could have a series of small wars here, mm -hmm. which would not be unique. Would, you know, the guy that, that Bush reminds me most of is Woodrow Wilson, who intervened against Mexico twice, uh, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, uh, got into World War One, and then invaded Russia, which everybody forgets, right after... World War One, the Russia was invaded by the United States, France, and England um, in an intervention that truly created the Cold War. Um, this guy, the, the notion of professorial types who like to be big machos is the scariest to me. The, uh -huh. the true tough guys don't go throwing punches every at every opportunity. They don't have to. Uh, the true tough guys never end up with the B-52s either. So I think there's a dangerous... Uh, pre this could be a dangerous precedent for the use of force, but it doesn't have to be a permanent one. And I hope that the, our po political leaders don't slink away into silence and say we just can never oppose anything ever again. We just have to go along with the flow. I think we must remember that this is a country in which we can say no to the state, not just the drugs. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk to Dave from Staten Island. Go ahead, Dave. Oh, boy. Thank You're on you. the air with Pete Hamill. Well, wow, two days in a row I got, I got these columnists who tell me why I do things and why I like things. Uh, Mr. Hamill, uh, it's not that the rest of us don't criticize this country. We certainly do, and everyone has a criticism. It is the motive uh, that uh, your columns seem seem to uh, give everyone why people do things, why the, uh, you, in your column the headline was the cops are taking their cue from Bush. Well, as I said earlier in this show, I didn't write the headline, well, and I, I would I, not I agree with that particular I, I would understand simplified that. version of it. I was saying something a little broader than that. But. Right, but uh, if I can just make a generality <clears throat> here, I mean... I was defending I'm, the cops, by the way, in this Right, column. and I, I would too. I tell you... Uh, enough subjects have been going on since I've been hanging on. I mean, I practically lost track of what I wanted to talk about. But uh, if I can make a generality, uh, wars are won uh, <laughs> simply because it's easier to fight a war than it is to fight uh, an economic problem in your own country. You, exactly. I mean, That's what I'm saying. Shoot, you can't shoot the opposition here, even though sometimes we would like to. Right. But uh, So you agree with pa uh, Pete? Uh, I, I agree with them. We all have our problems. Uh, I don't know if we can uh, ever say to the rest of the world, we're, we're not going to bother with you because we have problems here. We, we wouldn't have gotten in World War II uh, if we had decided, well, they've got their problem there, but we've got our problems here, too. Oh, but in fact, we do, that's exactly what we did. Remember, we never declared war on Hitler. I understand. We let Hitler go for two full years before the Japanese, uh, you know, attacked us in Pearl Harbor. Certainly. And then Hitler declared war on us three days later. Right. So, in fact, we did not go, even in World War II, where it was a clearly defined threat from a truly horrible person, Hitler. We didn't get into it, you know. And it, uh, Why not? Uh, well, part of it was that the Republican Party, which George Bush is the heir to, uh refused to go along with Roosevelt on it. Roosevelt also felt that he couldn't economically get into it, that we were not ready for it. He was building up our defenses. Remember, the draft was instituted in 1940 to try to get us ready for the war that we knew we would eventually get into. Uh, but part of it was that there were a lot of people in this country who sympathized with Hitler. This was a very anti-Semitic country at the time. Um, uh, hit both Hitler and Mussolini seemed to have taken thoroughly destroyed countries and rebuilt them into something that resembled power. Um, Hitler was a master of propaganda. If you go back and look at, say, those Lenny Riefenstahl movies and so on, 
you see him creating imagery in a very modern way that scared the crap out of the rest of the uh, rest of the world. All right. Now, Mr. So, Arnold, if I can, if I can bring this conversation down to the grassroots where we where right, we live every right. day. Sure. Now these cops that uh, killed this uh, car thief. Right. Now, I'll tell you, I live on a small street. There's 11 houses. I counted them before the phone call. Allegedly killed this car thief. But... Well, okay, allegedly. <laughs> All right, look. You know. um, Suicide by sidewalk, as you put right. it. Yeah. In this small street, four <laughs> right. cars have been stolen in the right. last couple of years. Right. Now, they, they got my car back. Right. All right. One of the small percentage this happens. This guy might have had it. I mean, he was convicted five times, according to the article. Right. Now, I don't know how you feel. But I prob if I caught him in my car, I probably would have done the same thing these cops allegedly did. Right. Um, but uh, I think that's why we hire cops, though, because you, neither you nor I um, are professionals. So our instinct, my instinct certainly, is if I catch a guy breaking into my car and I happen to have a baseball bat in my hand, I will hit him with it. You see, see now let me, I, I mean, can I interject but, here? But that's as, why we hire cops. But can I interject here that as a woman, I would not do that. I, would, I, I don't know, care if I had that. the bat. I would walk away and call the cops. Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't even hit him with my purse. I'd say, take the stupid car. I don't need the damn car. I'm not going near this No, night. but that's the way. But, but you, you, you know, if you grow up in New York, and I assume that this caller is, is, is a native New Yorker. He sounds like a New Yorker. Staten Island. That, that we... Well, that means he's from Brooklyn. <laughs> so. Thank you. We're hoping to get rid of Brooklyn. <laughs> That's another well, my shot. My sister who lives in Staten Island is a former Brooklynite. Anyway, the macho codes that we grew up with, which are specific and local, and they're always specific. In other words, a guy steals your car. You didn't go out then and hit anybody that happened to be around. You tried to find the guy that stole the car and hit him. You know, it was always specific. Uh, if somebody does something to your sister or whatever, you know, the, whatever the code demands, it was always specific. You didn't go out and and arbitrarily kill a whole bunch of people. You no, know, I, I understand. You, that. you see what I mean? That's sure. I, I have like to that, I, I have like to that part you. of the code of the street because it has an elemental justice right. to it. And I have to I have to wonder why this guy's mm -hmm. convicted five times and he's. He's still on the street. That's right. another story. Well, we don't kill people for <laughs> stealing cars yet. All right, I have to tell Dallas theme, uh, Bruce. Dallas is going off the air. You know, I didn't even know it was still on. <laughs> Tell you the truth. I don't think I have ever watched one episode of Dallas. I think I watched one. You did? Years ago. Uh, one I mean, or two, yeah. Is it like a big major production? I see this in the Yeah, it is. Well, it's been on for 14 oh, years. 14 Had a pretty good years. run, you know. God. That's enough. Boy, that time flew. Those 14 years. I watched uh, the episode of when J.R. was shot. Remember that? Who shot J.R.? Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Oh, that's like who killed Laura Palmer. They, right. they stole it from that. Yeah, it wasn't an original idea, no. Uh-huh. Who shot Jr.? I've forgotten now. <laughs> so long ago. <laughs> and who cares who shot Jr.? Who cares JR? anyway? That's right. But, you know, what's really uh, interesting to me today is Deborah Norville, you know, who I, I have been she had her baby not there. a big fan of Deborah's, as you might know, because I always feel that she smiles inappropriately when she gives bad news, right. which I'm not crazy about that. But she's not the only one who does it. A lot of them do that, I noticed. Mm -hmm. And it's like a really sick thing that they should correct on television. 21 Marines are killed, you know, like that. Yeah, and they're smiling. Yeah. Well, then there's the other extreme when they overdo the, uh, you know. The tragedy. The seriousness of it all. Yeah, who does that? Can you think of who, who's in that? Oh, I, I can't think offhand, but people do it. And, and that stands out, too. Yes. So, okay, come on, you know. Well, it's like rather. Oh, he, as I said, he always seemed like he was scared during the war, and that that over it. There's a scud missile coming, you know, like a nervous. <laughs> 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 but um, anyway, but I think Dan Rather's better as an anchor now than he is as a reporter out in the field. You do? I think so. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Peter Jennings was was on constantly, as we I know. Think, yeah, yeah. Uh, I sort of have a little Peter Jennings withdrawal now because I was seeing him so him. constantly during the war that now that this is over, he's like taking a rest and suppose he got I crave for him. All that? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I hope he did too. You know, I had a dream the other night that Paul Newman asked me to sleep with him. Is that right, Anne? Yeah. Well, I was in the subway 
And <laughs> he, he wanted, wanted to right, do it right there, huh? No, oh. he, he wanted... Uh, Joanne Woodward was, was nearby. She was, like, <laughs> waiting for a local. I see, yeah. And, <laughs> and you were on the express. And I was, like, on the express side, and, and Paul and I were standing there, and he was talking to me. This is uh -huh. a true dream. This is funny. And he, like, made a play for me. And he, but the date was for a year hence. Oh, yeah. Like, next year, could you meet me? Well, he was booked up, probably, till then. <laughs> he asks everybody that when he sees him in the subway. What do you think this means? I don't know. There are people who interpret dreams, so it could be interesting. Well, a lot of people have dreams about... You like Paul Newman, I guess. Yeah, I like him very much, but I mean, I don't understand why he would come up in a dream. But uh, a lot of people dream about um, Woody Allen. He's in a lot of people's dreams, Is Woody Allen. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why that is. I know a girl who had a dream that she was opening a diner with the Mox Brothers. I mean, there are people who have some very strange dreams. Yeah, that is strange. Yeah. Anyway, um, now, the reason I brought up Deborah so Norville... So did you agree to meet Paul in oh, a year or what? Um, I... Yes, I was... <laughs> <laughs> I did. Yeah, okay. Um, but I was thinking to myself, why would a big movie star like this want to have an affair uh, with what, me? March 18th, 1992, huh? I'll see you then. Yeah, it's just like, what does he want? What's going on here? So I guess it must have... I'm lacking a certain amount of confidence. Well, he knows you're on, you're on the up and coming here. Um, I don't know if I wanted to really do it, to tell you the truth. But you had time to change your mind, so you said I yes initially. I had a initially. year. Yeah. So I figured I'll say yes. That's I can right. always, I, as my manager always, always says, you can always roll over in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> right. Anyway, Deborah Norville, here's the thing with her. Yes. She took the pregnancy leave to have the little Carl Nikolai, that's the baby's name. Nobody uh -huh. has, like, uh, they, they, they're going back to, like, the no big... No Bobs and Jims anymore. The heavy uh, German, Germanic names. We had Wolfgang, Wolfgang. Van Halen the other day, yeah. you know? Um, uh, Adolf may be coming back soon, Adolf, for all yeah. we know. Mm -hmm. And uh, little baby Bismarck. <laughs> <laughs> but Deborah took off to have the baby, and... Uh, she was then photographed in People magazine, this week's People. Yes. And she's nursing the baby. And you see his little head. And you see Deborah wearing, you know, a little caftan. Mm -hmm. And you don't see any skin on her really. You know, you don't see her breast, but she's nursing the baby. Now there's a big hoopla over at NBC that she shouldn't have done this. Really? Mm hmm But no, nobody's being quoted. No names are being mentioned. Sources there said Norville had characteristically sought no counsel for NBC's press relations department, had gone ahead and arranged the story. But Deborah, you're supposed to check with Big Daddy, don't you know that? But at NBC News and elsewhere, Norville's peers returned a quick verdict on the story that was summed up by one executive experienced in making images and maintaining them. Listen to what he said. Quote, a serious newswoman does not do this. This will define her in that motherhood role and put a lot of parameters around her. Uh -huh. In other words, if you are a mother, you are not taken seriously. Yeah. Now, to me... According to this man. Well, this is, this is a powerful man at the network level talking. In other words, this is a man who projects the images that we are buying, just like this guy... And he's the, sending out a message to all addiction. these anchor women all over America who are striving to become network people. Dry those eggs up, is what yeah. he's saying. Yeah. But, I mean, it's like this religious addiction we were talking about this morning that might have put a few people to sleep. I understand. Yeah, um, a couple in the control room, I think. <laughs> You know, in the control room, if you're not talking about sex, they nap, all oh, right? That's right, yeah. Uh, you know, so anyway, um, he was talking about people like the Moonies and these James Jones followers and people who are not thinking for themselves, okay? That's what television, in a way, does. You watch the box and you, form, you, you yeah. listen to what they have to tell you, which is why I really think that images on television are very, very important and why this videotape of these cops who are beating up this black guy in L.A. is going to make a big dent in, uh, in relations in the country, I think, because we see it finally. Well, let's hope so. So now, in other words, is he saying to us that if a woman is a mother, we're not supposed to take her seriously as a news person? This, to me, is sending a message that women who are biologically determined to have children will never be taken seriously. That's what it says. That's what he's saying. But he is one of those people who's I in know that, but I don't, think the I, don't, I don't think the masses buy that, and certainly women don't buy it. Baloney. I don't believe so. No, no. I, well, not women that have had children. Because no. Because you're saying you can't take them seriously, whatever they may be doing. No, but the, as long as these type of guys are in power, this, this idea is going to be perpetuated. And it's an outrage. It's an outrage to me. That she, they would say to her that if you're a serious newswoman, why you don't project why, why an image of motherhood. Person, why doesn't he come forth with his name and say who he is? Because he's a sniveling coward, whoever yeah, he is. That's right. That's why. I'll see what else I have to say here. Ronnie McEntee, an official of the New York State East La Leche League, a nursing support group that likes to see role models such as Norville, says we would like to see more women nursing in public. 
We recommend that women do what they feel comfortable with. But that's another issue, nursing in public. Yeah. I mean, I, but, I don't, but this I don't man's care. Comments I'm, were, I'm not that yeah. interested in that one. I'm more interested in the idea that there is an idea, that there is a, per a perception that if you have a baby, you're not to be taken seriously. Yes. Wow. That's why I say people won't go with that. People can't. The masses won't buy that. I think that I think that they have managed to project that in a way. I mean, think about it. I don't it. think so. Look at all of these women on television who have had babies. They don't flaunt it. They don't discuss it. No, but it. everybody knows it. They do too flaunt it. I mean, they talk about it. They sit there pregnant on television. They all the pictures in the paper when they have the baby. Are those the anchor people? Are those the one who re were reporting on the war? No, Leslie Stahl is the only woman who has any clout on that level. And she doesn't have any kids, or if she did, yes, they're she in the does. closet. We don't hear about them. She and does. She was pregnant five or six. She was, she was one of the early ones. She had a baby five or six years yeah, ago. Yeah, but she doesn't project a maternal image. Well. She projects a non-maternal image, don't you think? Well, maybe, but she's older than the rest of them, too. But the men can be 30, and they'll be taken seriously. A woman in her childbearing years can't be taken seriously, according to this bozo. Well, yeah, but see, you're believing him. You're going off on it. I am. That's true, as I am wont to do. <laughs> All right. Anyway, I'm going to take a break here, and uh, let's go. Come on. Uh, you know, whatever. I don't have to talk about Deborah Norville all the time, but we can talk about her, whatever else is going on. Let's See, talk now this will go, let me interrupt one yeah. time, and I'll, and I'll let you go. Yeah. Uh, this Deborah Norville, you know, they're speculating that she won't be back on the Today Show. See, this will Now add, I want her back. This will add fuel to the fire there, and if she doesn't get it back, people who are supporting her will say, well, that's why, because she went against the grain of the... NBC management, and mm. she had this all arranged without checking with us first, and so. Well, these issues of childbearing and news people, women, is really getting to be an issue, I think, with that Vieira case, and now this, and Connie Chung, who's ovulating. I mean, this type of thing we have to keep. <laughs> I mean, there's a certain <laughs> amusement to it. it but is. there's also a serious issue here. Yeah. I also wouldn't mind talking about this L.A. tape that the, of the cops beating the guy up. If you want to bring that up, let's talk about that a little. Uh, more tapes today, you mean. And now they, they have the, the, audio tapes. the audio tapes of them having a grand old time discussing what they did, those yeah. pigs. Yeah. I mean, it's unbelievable to me. Pigs? And, that was from the 60s. Yeah, well, I'm old. <laughs> and, the, and Gates, get him out. The guy Gates, right. I think get it may be time out. for him to step aside. Yeah. It's, please. This, you know, when I saw that tape, and I, I happened to be, go to a movie, I saw this movie Reunion over the weekend. I told you about it, yes. about Nazi Germany. Yes. And the Hitler, Hitler's people, his, his um, honchos, his... Um, uh, what do you call them, uh, stormtrooper types yeah. that were just beginning to get into the movement and this pro-Hitler thing. They would go around the cities of Germany. They were not popular. They were not taken seriously. This is early in the late, I guess, 30s. The brown shirts? Oh, the, the brown shirts. And they would beat up Jews. They would just say, you look Jewish, and then beat them up. And people were helpless or refused to do anything. And it, it seems to me that this is a very similar thing that we're watching here. It's not, these people are secretly... Stormtroopers are secretly beating up non-white people in this country. It's, mm -hmm. an, it's an outrage.